Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and welcome to the Martini, Candid Conversations with a Twist. My name is Gus. I'm Ari Rentals Director of Business Development for North America, and I've been with the Ari family for over 17 years now, and I'm honored to be your host today. At Ari Rental, our goal is to equip you, the filmmakers, with the most inspiring image technology in the world. Our services cross borders and continents with a network of facilities in North America, Europe, and the UK, bringing you first-class camera, lighting, and grip equipment wherever you may be. Our team is there to welcome you with friendly expertise, personalized solutions, and a relationship built on trust. As a friendly reminder, please send us your questions via the Q&A tab on Zoom, and we'll get to as many of those as possible during the course of today's show. We are very fortunate to have with us today the incredibly kind and very talented cinematographer, Sean Peters. Sean has had many careers before he found his path back to filmmaking, which we'll let him talk about later on here. Um, he started shooting music videos for many successful artists before moving into narrative. And many of these films have premiered at Sundance, Tribeca, and the Toronto International Film Festival. Sean's projects include Random Acts of Flyness, Adam, Goldie, and the upcoming Really Love. Thanks for joining us today, Sean. Really appreciate you being with us. Thank you. <laughs> So um, if you're okay, I'd like to start with a couple icebreakers, some fun stuff. See if I can mm -hmm. throw you off guard a little bit. <laughs> so imagine you're on a virtual studio, those ones surrounded with LEDs and all that stuff, and uh, you have to put yourself in a state of zen. <laughs> Where would you be? That's the first question. Where would you be on this virtual studio? On a virtual studio, where would I be to find a place of zen? Yeah. Uh, probably the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to that's gonna make the next question very interesting. <laughs> While you're in the bathroom, what are you listening to? <laughs> um, probably uh, Search for the New Land by Lee Morgan. Probably Ooh. that album. Or maybe uh, The Journey of Scantinon, I think it's called. Alice Coltrane. Or something like that. Or the Ode. Some jazz, sort of spiritual jazz, and some instrumental thing, probably. Nice. And uh, if this bathroom had a window, what would you see outside of that window? Probably a, a brick wall and hopefully like one tungsten light source. Dark <laughs> 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 alley with like a tungsten light source and a brick wall. That would be, that'd be what I'd want to see, I think. Well, this is going to make the next couple of questions even weirder now, but that's okay. Because <laughs> if you're on this virtual stage all by yourself, <laughs> in a place of Zen, which is the bathroom with a brick wall outside the window, <laughs> you had to order something to eat, <laughs> what would it be? <laughs> if I had to order something to eat, that's interesting. Uh, probably, I don't know, what's the easy, I probably would order a salad, honestly. I'm trying to stay... I'm trying to stay gluten and grain free, <laughs> you know, so some type of grainless, grainless situation with some vegetables and meat, probably. Some sort of. <laughs> and what would you have to drink with it? Um, probably some coconut water. Ah, okay. Man, I'm feeling very zenful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I went to the bathroom before we started this session. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I should have done this. <laughs> well, all right, thank you for that. That was fun. I, um, I'm, I'm really hoping you can share with us um, about your path back to filmmaking because I think it's such a fascinating story. So after being um, in school and getting out into the real world, um, can you tell us a little bit about what you did and how you found your way back? <laughs> well. You know, my, I was telling you before, Gus, my story is sort of serpentine run back into film. I, I went to grad school probably in the 1920s or whatever it was a long time ago. And I, I kind, of, kind of came out of, in grad school, I did a lot of still photography. We did shoot, it was like more of a, it was an MFA, but it was, and it was, it wasn't an MFA in film. It was like an MFA, in, it was like a multidisciplinary MFA. And um, I ended up, shooting some 16 millimeter films in grad school, but I think my thesis project ended up being um, a, docu a still documentary 
project or a photo essay of this uh, organization in Atlanta called the Shrine for Black and Brown. I was in grad school in South Carolina in a small program at the University of South Carolina. So I would go back to Atlanta and stay with this organization, sort of with these people, and I'd spend kind of weeks at a time sort of documenting them. And it ended up being sort of my thesis. It was a still project. Um, and even, even I don't know if I've told you the story, I don't know how much time we have to talk about it, but I actually ended up in that graduate program by accident. It was a total uh, kind of thing of chance because I wasn't, I went to Morehouse College in Atlanta and I majored in English actually. And although there was a bill of film classes over at Clark that I did take, which is in our university complex, another college in our university complex, I took the two, we had two 16 millimeter uh, cinematography courses at, in the whole university complex that was available. So I took those classes and I kind of played around with some friends a little bit in college, but my intention after graduation was to teach English in, the, in high school. So like I was doing interviews over the summer and uh, you know, my junior year and stuff like that, meeting people. And I happened, <clears throat> a good friend of mine who was also from New York, um, was heavy into filmmaking. He was doing a lot of shorts in undergrad and stuff and had interned with Spike Lee back in New York and all that kind of thing. And he found this program in the University of South Carolina and he was like, you know, I want to apply. And I said, cool. He said, why don't, why don't you take the ride with me? You know, I don't want to go alone. and uh, I'm going to show my little film to the chart department chair. So I took the ride with him to South Carolina just to take the ride. And, and I ended up, you know, in this meeting with like the head of the department, one of the professors, um, and my friend and myself, and he showed his film. And I remember the professor sort of being very critical of the film for its sort of cultural specificity. I think that's what my memory serves me right. He kept saying that the film was, um, wasn't universal enough and it was too culturally specific. And, um, you know, it felt didactic for him in some way. And so <clears throat> I ended up, my friend was not really, um, He's really much more of a visual person and not very verbal. So he ended up sort of getting trounced by this guy in this, art, in this conversation. And I just couldn't help myself. I ended up interjecting myself into the conversation and debating with this dude. <laughs> and, um, you know, and then, you know, that kind of ended and the department chair came up to me afterwards and was like, you know, I'd like to be in touch with you. And so I was like, okay, cool, whatever. At that time, ancient time, it was like before, you know, cell phone. So I like literally, I think I had a pager maybe or like something like that. I, I like literally like gave my mom's number, home number to, to, the, to the chairman. And I was working, I got an internship summer, that summer after, and my mom called. And was like, this woman from South Carolina wants to talk to you. And I said, who? She called me and she was like, you know, do what do you think about coming here if I gave you a full scholarship? You know? And I was like, uh, wow. she's like, I'll, I'll even pay you as a, a PA, I mean, I mean not PA, I mean, teacher's assistant TA. And so I was like, okay, it was like an offer I couldn't refuse, so I did. What a great story. <laughs> no, you never told me that before. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> that's like a total like I didn't, Yeah, that's how I ended up studying, being able, to, being able to kind of study the form of photography. You know? Yeah, very cool. And then you went off and decided to get into kind of the corporate America world and Got involved in yeah, some yeah, and that wasn't that wasn't that was a choice of survival at the time, you know. At the time, you know, what we know is sort of digital photography and didn't really exist. Everything was at that time shot on film, and the access to, um, you know, just access to equipment, access to being able to shoot film and process it was much more it was expensive, and it was a much more of a barrier for an individual to sort of practice, you know? And um, I wasn't dealing with, you know, I don't come from a family with a lot of means. So, you know, I, at the time, it's, it's a long story, but I got shot a 16 millimeter film for this producer. And I think I did it by myself or you know, just me and the camera. And I think like a piece of, like something got in the, into the gate and like scratched the film. And I remember at the time I was working for the, I was volunteering at the equipment, I was working at the equipment room of film, film video arts um, by Union Square. Anybody from New York that's been around for a while knows like that, that was like the film rental house, the independent film. 
And so I would work there, you know, just to learn the cameras and stuff. And so this producer found me there. I shot this film for him and it got kind of trashed or whatever. He sort of like cursed me out so bad. I was like 24, or something like 25, like, he like cursed me to death, you know, like you'll never make it in this business. <laughs> and I think at the time I sort of internalized it, you know, and I was, I didn't have money and I didn't have a job really. And I was living with my mom, my parent, you know, my family home at the moment. And I was like, I gotta get out of there. And um, I got introduced to this guy who was working at at and friends with the brother. He was like rocking the bands, you know, he was like, he was like, he was like, you know, this like rich dude. And I'm like, oh, what are you doing? He's like, you know, I'm working at at and 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 like, you know, bandwidth and like the internet. You know, this is like before I really knew like broadband wasn't really super a thing at that point. At that point, it was just starting to come into the world. But he was like doing corporate broadband solutions, you know, mm. banks and stuff. And I was like, wow, um, how can I get an interview? <laughs> <laughs> and so, and that time, that time used to be a, a, you know, it's a longer story, but his younger brother, he and I had like a little internet company. It was called New York Magazine Online, and we were trying to get like African American businesses in Harlem and Brooklyn to like have web presences. This is before those businesses really found that valuable. So, we would go door to door, they were like, we're going to design a website for you. And that was more like me, I was more like kind of in biz dev <clears throat> part, and I would do all the photography and stuff. Um, but you know, we didn't make any real money, and so I was still broke and like doing part time, you know, temp work and stuff. So when he came along and was talking about this broadband thing, I had already kind of had experience in the, in the web space a little bit as an independent, little independent business. So I ended up going to an interview and I got the job, you know, and then I got promoted like three times in ATT when I was there. And you know, you're like 27, 28 years old, and you're making a lot of money you know, living in Brooklyn, my own my apartment and kind of you just kinda of get lost in it for a while. And, mm. and I was part of a, a collective, an arts collective called Red Clay Arts in Brooklyn that started in Atlanta originally. And um so I would do a lot of still photography at that time, exhibit work. Um, you know, the little cash I had, I would travel to different countries and stuff and take still photography for myself. And then I would exhibit with this collective. Um so I had my foot in the art world, but I was a suit and tie dude, you know, during the day, you know, I'd be like, my friends would laugh at me and be like, you know, Sean's our, our suit in the collective. <laughs> 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 you know, and you're like, you know, you're like young and you got this like, tie, you got this like big neck, you got the fat money face, you know, you saw, I was real skinny my whole life and all of a sudden I started making money and I was like getting the money face, you know, and, uh, you know, kind of, and I was always sort of a, you know, my fashion sense before that was always a bit more sort of trial call quest. <laughs> it wasn't a suit and tie. So my friends would see me like, how at me? Anyway, so that, um, to make a long story short, that kind of folded in. One of my clients at at t was this uh, African-American owned like, information technology sort of uh, management consulting firm. Uh, and they, they kind of liked me a lot. And so they were like, why don't you come work for us? I ended up working for them. Mm. Um, at a, like a ridiculous base salary kind of thing. And then the division that I was in um, decided they wanted to leave that company and start their own company with an at t contract. And they asked me to come on as a partner. So I met this partner now with all these like older dudes who have, who have uh, uh, retired from at t And I'm like, you know, at that time, I'm like 28, 29 or something like that. And so I had a company, an, an IT company that was based in New Jersey that I was a partner in and we did a lot of like smart home technology stuff. We'd go like into network and build smart communities with, you know, building infrastructure and internet infrastructure, mm -hmm. and a portal for residents. It was like the like very beginning of like putting like localized internet sort of communication and commerce um, sort of like portals at the time for people to keep in touch. It was kind of like what neighborhood and citizenry and all that kind of stuff is doing now or citizen. Mm -hmm. is doing it now but back then you know so we were doing a lot of that kind of thing and then the company kind of you know the stock market kind of crashed for a second the company didn't do well and i left and got into the music business <laughs> with a, with a friend like of mine. <laughs> yeah with a friend of mine from college we invested in this artist that we went to college with and then we started managing a bunch of musicians and putting out records and 
you know, traveling the world, sort of in the music business, and I and lost everything in, in that business. So Ooh. then I started working in a bit of a sort of a event, um, cre- creating music events with some friends of mine in Brooklyn, and that was going really well. And then that, and then I just sort of decided to go back to um, NYU. Had this like summer intensive program in cinematography that. You could go, you could do it. And I was like, I'm going to save up my little bucks and take the course just to sort of, you know, reacquaint myself with it. And I remember talking to a friend of mine named Blitz, Blitz the Ambassador, who at that time was a rapper. And we were talking about our dreams. And I was like, you know, my real dream is to be a cinematographer. And I, I just never did it out of fear, you know. And I'm going to go back and do this class. And I ended up doing it. And that's kind of like, at that time, was like the beginning of sort of the DSLR technology. You know, yeah. So I was able to kind of finish that, and I was because I had my music business thing. I was able to like the first thing happened. I was approached by this artist in Holland, actually, this rapper from Holland, who wanted me to A and R his record in the states. So I ended up working on this guy's record, and then he wanted me to come to to Rotterdam to meet with I mean Amsterdam to meet with uh, music executives there for him. And so I was like, I have this camera. Let me shoot a music video. So we did for the album. And that's like the first thing I've shot, I think, in motion since that, probably that 16 millimeter piece that I messed up <laughs> in the year when I was like in my twenties, you know? And um, <clears throat> and so I, I shot this video, came back to New York, and I saw this Indiegogo campaign from this kid named Terrence Nance, this director. And I was like, wow, this dude is like really creative, man. It, just the way he put together that campaign and the, the, his imagery and the way he was using some of the animation and all these other sort of things. I was like, wow, this dude is really, really amazing. And uh, I was like, I would love to meet him one day. And then I, mean, I swear to you guys, it couldn't have been more than two or three weeks later, I ran into him on the platform. I saw him on the train platform, like in New York on the A train line. And then, you know, he had that big afro, so it was like, it was easy to recognize him. So I walked up to him and I was like, are you Terrence Nance? <laughs> and he was like, yeah. And I was like, oh man, I saw your Indiegogo campaign for that, that short film you were making. He was, like, he was like, oh yeah. I said, I said, I know you live in the neighborhood. He was like, well, I just got back here from, from Paris. I was living in Paris for a while and I'm back. And I was like, cool. I was like, man, I would love to work with you one day on something. He was like, what do you do? And I just had to set it. I was like, oh, I'm a cinematographer. <laughs> And he was like, yeah, he was like, do you, have anything you, can, do you have anything you can send me? And I was like, yeah. And I sent him the music video from Holland. And he hit me back like right away. He's like, yo, I love this, man. It's really beautiful. Can you work with me on this music video for my friend um, like next week? And I was like, yeah. And then um, that friend was Blitz the Ambassador, who was my awesome. <laughs> and I didn't know their connection. And um, we ended up doing the video and got a lot of buzz. And then that video and we get another video and then we get this and then we get that. And then we worked on a film called Over Simplification of a Beauty that got in Sundance. Then a few other short films later and you know, then I was, you know, signed to William Morris as a cinematographer and mm. that was, that's kind of how it worked. Very cool. I'm gonna bring I mean, up some of the- Oh, oh that's no, great. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's <laughs> Amazing. I'm going to bring up some of the imagery that you shared with us while we continue talking, if that's okay. Uh, kind of look through some stuff here. And um, so as you, as you were developing into this and doing more and more of this, was there, were there inspirations that you uh, kept going back to and things you kept looking at? And Yeah. When I was in, um, hello, you're showing some of my still photography stuff from, from Sierra Leone when I was there. Yeah, the portraits of the kids. We ended up working with some kids who were homeless, living in some of them sleeping in graveyards, and um, they're also gang members. Weirdly enough, in Sierra Leone, they have Crips and Bloods from different neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So they wear like a blue hat. This guy's a Crip with a blue hat, and they wear their blue. And um, there were about fourteen or so kids that we worked on this short film with as actors and as crew. It was part of this program out of Germany that was paid. I forgot the name of the brand, but it was a German sneaker brand that paid for this thing. So I was there with a, a still photographer named Baron Claiborne, who was probably 
the main influence of probably the modern black aesthetic in photography. Most people don't know that, but I would wager that most of our, most black cinematographers, like the, the guys I looked up to in the beginning, like Malik Saeed and Arthur Tapro, especially Malik, I would say, you know, his still photography and the way, you know, what people are doing now, you know, with like oiling the skin and exposing for highlights and using sort of dark black skin as a sculptural medium. He was doing that in the, in the 90s, mm. you know, the late 90s. And, and um, so anyway, I had a chance to work with him on this project in Syria, you know, and that was a great, great pleasure. You know, those, those stills you were, you were showing were part of that. This my own personal still in the project. <laughs> Um, it's me and Terrence, like an early picture of us together. This is a, uh, a still from a film called Swimming in Her Skin Again, a short film. I think that's the film that the agents um, saw originally. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you keep the uh, collective going that you were Red Clay? Yep. It's not officially going, but all my friends are here. All my friends all live, in, most of us live in the same, like, we all, I still live in New York, but I have a house in Baltimore and a bunch of my friends who are in Baltimore uh, from the collective all live in the same neighborhood, um, along with Bradford Young, who wasn't a part of the collective, but he's in the same neighborhood too. But this photographer that you're showing now is Roy De, from is Roy DeCarabo. He's important. He's a extremely, you know, he's a very influential reference for many African-American photographers specifically, and I have a great Roy DeCarabo story. Um, when I was in grad school in South Carolina, what's the grad school? Yeah, first year of grad school in South Carolina. Um, I was introduced to his work by a photography professor of mine named Gene Crediford. His old, old man looked like Albert Einstein, big, big, crazy, curly. He was like a lunatic and he was like crazy. He looked like, out literally like Einstein. But he had an amazing eye and his own photography was amazing. And he was, at that time, I was really into Sebastian Salgado and like, you know, Gordon Parks. And, um, <laughs> you know, all the New York photographers, you know, um, and, you know, street photographers and stuff. And he was like, you gotta, you know, you gotta look into this African-American photographer from New York named Roy DeCarabo. And I was like, wow. So I started, started digging into him and I got obsessed. And so he, at the time, he, I'm dating myself, but at the time he was a professor still at Hunter University in New York. Mm. And I called when I got home for the summer after my, my first year in grad school, I called him and I was like, you know, um, photographer, photography student, you know, and I'd love to come by and show you some of my work. And like, <clears throat> I think he told me, I don't really critique non, um, photographers and all my students and I can't, you know, I can't, I have so much, I don't have the time. And I was like, damn, so I was like, I'm not giving up. So I literally would go to his office in the waiting room and just stalk him, and just sit there. You know? <laughs> and so I did it for like three days and then I finally sort of like, I'm not gonna go back there, but I called him again. And he was like, I saw you sitting in that lobby. <laughs> he was like, come in, man. I got a few minutes for you. He said, but I'm going to tell you right now, I'm super rough on photographers. And if I don't like it, I'm going to tell you. And I'm going to tell you, probably tell you to stop shooting. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I, got my little, I got all my prints in this book that I compiled, you know, printed in my dark room, in the dark room in school. Uh, mostly from that project, I was the thesis thing I was working on. And uh, I get to his office, you know, he makes me wait for like a half hour, finally comes out, he says, come on in, I, I go in and um, I give him the book and he's like really quiet the whole time looking through my book, like, doesn't say nothing, no expression, poker face, blah, blah, blah. He closes the book and he's like, you should, kill, you should, you should keep shooting, you should keep shooting. <laughs> he said, but you print with way too much contrast. And he's like, come here. So he brought me into his little darkroom space at Hunter and showed me like the cold light printer that he had. He had a cold light uh, printer. It was like graded paper at the time that he used. He told me the grade. He was like, you know, you really need to get more tonality in your work, you know, more gray tones in your work. And it was just a beautiful, you know, I mean, I stayed in touch with him over the years. I ended up going to his funeral and stuff. And I know his daughter. But uh, that's a, that's my Roy DeCarabo story. Mm. So he's a, he's a huge influence. And then you moved on into doing short films and narratives, and mm -hmm. and working with uh, some of uh, some of your colleagues doing stuff. You said you you shot a lot for Bradford, and you uh, shared some of the work you did. 
you guys. Yeah, I worked on two things with Bradford uh, as a director. One was um, this common video we do called Black America Again. I really just more did, I didn't know I wasn't, he shot most of that video. I did all the, por all the portraits that you see that I sent you. Mm -hmm. He had me, I was sort of like the second DP on that particular project. And so I did all the, you know, he couldn't do everything. So I did all the portraiture work out inside and on the street and all that kind of stuff. So this particular thing that you're showing now and seeing on the screen is a, is a film that he, Terrence Nance, um, Jenny Kuru, um, and, and a few other people, Mark, um, well, my names are not escaping me, but it's a collective called the Umacroma that we're kind of a part of. And I was the DP on this and all this Baltimore stuff that, you, that you've seen. Um, so we, this is fun because we shot on many formats, you know, mm -hmm. we shot with the, uh, yeah, the Ari, um, the, the black and white sensor was at the XT. Um, yep. and then we shot with, uh, you know, we did some 16, I think on the four, the Ari, the 416, uh, you know, we also did, uh, you know, this is some slow motion stuff that we did, hyper slow motion stuff that we did. Uh, but yeah, we, we did a lot of a lot of different formats on that show, obviously, but I think the mini as well. I don't know what this is, why that's there. That's like <laughs> Sorry. How I got to you, I have no idea. <laughs> this, is one of the, this is one of the portraits from, from the common thing, the Black America, again, thing that he directed. Uh, so that was him, his direction. Um, and this is some stuff from the, from the XT, I think. Yeah. This is gorgeous, this portrait stuff. Yeah, this is like my friend's, this is like in my friend's house. <laughs> so it's not a studio, like we just blacked it out. You know, and what we're doing here is like, a, we have a couple of, of S60s um, sky panels like bouncing off the ceiling, they had a white ceiling. And then I had like a diffusion, I'm not sure what it was, like maybe a quarter grid or something that was hanging in a, in a you know, sort of a, a diaper, like super, super close to their faces. Like it was like an inch, like right above that frame, there's wow. a diaper diffusion. And that's kind of what, what the quality looked like, what that quality is coming from. Mm. And then you got into the longer form narrative and mm -hmm. uh, some really interesting uh, subject matter and characters that mm -hmm. you took on. And uh, the first one here is Adam. The project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How'd you? How did? What drew you to the project? What did you say to him? What preceded it? No. What? Uh, what drew it? What drew you to it? You oh man. <laughs> well, I'm like, I think when we talked before, I was telling you that I'm really interested in subject matters and characters that I wouldn't normally meet in my my regular everyday life. I'm super interested in like delving into the psychology of. Um, of people that I that I don't know, you know, and also it's like you know that notion of you know when you're a people watcher and you watch someone on the train or you watch someone pass your window and you kind of imagine to yourself what their life must be like, or at least I do, you know. Mm -hmm. And you know this is a film that's directed by Reese Ernst, um, who is a trans male. Uh, I mean, he's a director, but he's uh, a trans male identity. Um, and uh, the character is placed in sort of a queer sort of trans world identity and it plays with sort of the, the notion of masculinity and um, gender sort of as a, a conceit in the film. And, you know, those are, those are worlds that fascinate me. Mm -hmm. And working with Reese was really fantastic because he, he has a really wonderful um, sense of sort of intuition and empathy. Um, and so, you know, he's always trying to find, you know, sort of this deeper psychology and empathy with his characters. And I really learned a lot from him. Mm -hmm. And then um, Goldie was the next project here that um, you shared with us with stills. It's really, I love the, I love the use of color. Yeah, that was really, really, a, we really went for that in this film. A lot of this, some of this is like, some of this is 16, some of this is digital, kind of, kind of mixed the two. Uh, and uh, Sam DeYoung is a filmmaker from 
Amsterdam who was in New York for about a year working on this film, writing it and going to shelters and hanging out with, with people that he would meet at shelters, that lived in shelters. And this film sort of is about a teenager who lives in a shelter with her family and ends up in this aspirational thought to like be in this music video and wear this crazy fancy coat. And so it's kind of like this, this sort of um, comment on sort of consumer culture, um, you know, sort of told to this amazing heroine, you know, that we have. And I was drawn to this project because of Sam. Sam, Sam is also very create, uh, courageous. I would say that would be the adjective I would use for him as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. He's unbridled, almost like, I'm going to say childlike, but it's like he has a very youthful um, curiosity about the medium and, and, and camera support and how the cameras to move. And we were doing a lot of stuff handheld with with a servo zoom, you know, like on the on the handles. And we would, I did all the camera, I did all the um, camera uh, work on this one. And, you know, it was like, you know, we'd be swinging pans and, and then I'd zoom in, you know, from like a crazy swing, you know, and I'd zoom in to a character and then we do like a 360 dolly and have a whole conversation with the characters in the center of this like, you know, circular dolly. And we'd be just the whole, the whole conversation would just be circling around them. We came up with these things during our shot listing project uh, process, you know, just, we always thought about it like emotion. It was definitely fun, but it was like, what's the emotion? What do we want to do to the viewer? And how do you want to disrupt um, sort of this, the, the form in a way to make the viewer feel sort of have a world that's disrupted in the same way that Goldie's world was ended up disrupted in sort of kinetic. Her, she had this kinetic chase. You have to watch the film. It's like mm -hmm. the world kind of flips upside down and then she's on this kinetic chase to both find her home for her sisters and get into this music video. And it's like, we really tried to find it. This still is from a movie, a film called Really Love that I, worked on with Angel Christie Williams, who is another fantastic, amazing director who really understands um, character and emotion. You know, this is a love story. And I, had, I don't think I'd done a love, love story before. I guess they're all love stories to a certain degree, but this is a traditional mm -hmm. love story. And, um, you know, watching Angel, um, you know, really dig out the uh, chemistry um, in this amazing, beautiful love from these two principal characters and, and their friends it was really inspiring for me. So these are some of the stills. And it, this hasn't come out yet. It was, it was uh, in. It was supposed to be in South by Southwest, but as you know, the festival it was. It was under competition in South by Southwest, but the festival was canceled. Ah. So hopefully you'll see it. It looks gorgeous. Yeah, I can't wait to see, see it in the, in the theater or streaming a streaming location near you. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice of you to give us a, give us kind of a tease here. It's wonderful. And then uh, Random Acts, your show on HBO. Yeah, Random Acts was really a, a school, man, because we didn't have a lot of money and it was a lot of, a uh, lot to do. You know, I don't know, know if you, you guys, if anybody who's seen it, it's like a trillion little segments that had to be shot, you know, and each one of them had to have sort of an, uh, a voice within its own. Um, some of them more surreal, some of them based more on reality with a bit of surreal, all kind of this like sort of parody model and a lot of magical realism. Um, and this is obviously from the minds of uh, some amazing writers um, <laughs> that were galvanized by Terrence uh, Nance again. And, um, you know, so many amazing writers. I wish I could just rattle them off, you know, Naima and Darius and Shaka and Nuotomo and there's so many. <laughs> there's so many. I don't think uh, Miriama. There's so many of them that are just amazing. And so many women writers as well. So it was, this, this series was a pleasure because it really broke a lot of, broke into a lot of um, things that we sort of talk about around gender and masculinity and race and poly, you know dystopia and you know the future of it, it's, it's so much in this series it's hard to yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like a highest a complete mashup you know of uh so many things so that was a, a tough show just because we had a lot of long hours we didn't have a, a long schedule didn't have a huge crew 
that I think that series, that first season was non-union. Mm. So it was, it was really crazy. You know, I was telling a story the other day, like last day of the shoot was like a, maybe a 20 hour day, a 19 hour day. And um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a segment called Nuka Land where they go into this fantasy, almost like a Peter Pan world. And it's like all these fantastical colors and blah, 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 blah. And I remember lighting it um, with my gaffer, Alex Ash. And I remember, um, who's the cinematographer? DP now. And I remember, um, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine, James Jenkins, who was, who was a VFX supervisor at the time, a VFX guy on the series. And I was looking in the monitor with him and I was like, oh my God, I think I used too many colors. <laughs> and I was like, I can't see anymore, man. I'm so tired. I'm so beat down. I was like, does this look okay? I can't really, I, I don't, I think I overdid it. <laughs> but then, you know, I've heard, I've heard from people that that's, you know, photographically, that's one of their favorite segments and that all the, that the, there are a lot of bold choices in terms of color and people like that, so. Yeah. What, um, can we dive a little bit into lighting? I'd love to hear your philosophy on that because you did send me some stuff over and we talked about it a little bit together about how you just, sometimes you'll just go to a location, just watch the light, study mm -hmm. the light. And mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and how you approach lighting for certain sequences. Well, you know, my, my overall sort of thinking about it is that, you know, so much of what we know about lighting is, you know, from the time with, with babies, obviously. You know, I think we have these like supercomputers that are always gathering sort of micro data, you know, for how many years you, you're using it. You know, you're gathering sort of all this billions and billions and billions of like micro data and it's stored there in like memory, you know, and, and some memory for me at least is very emotional. And I was telling someone, I think I was telling you the other day that, you know, if someone hypnotized me, I probably could remember breastfeeding from my mother. And that's a crazy thought. <laughs> but sometimes I think I feel like I have memories of it a little bit, at least mm -hmm. the intimacy part of it. You know, and I, I'm sure I, I was looking up at my mother's face as a, the first person that I loved, you know, and I was looking at, you know, the tungsten light that might have been in the room at night or the window light, you know. And when I was a kid, I remember explicitly being in my mother's kitchen and she's, I don't know if you guys remember those like little mirrors that used to, banks used to give out years ago, like these rubber and little sleeves and women were wearing, having in their pocketbooks. My mom always collected those and I had, a, I used to steal them from her and like use them. But I remember being on like her floor in the, in the kitchen as a kid, like seven or six or seven years old. And I would be like reflecting the light beams from the windows and I would like highlight underneath the cabinets or underneath the stove or her shoes. And I had always, I never thought of it as something, you know, I never sort of thought that I'd ever be a cinematographer and, you know, work in lighting, but light, even magnifying glasses as a kid, I mean, I look back, I've always was super hyper um, in tune with it and, and curious about it, you know, how it moved across the walls, you know, during the course of a day or the lint that you, it would capture. And, and as a source, and the sun in general as a source and how it interacted in the room and even artificial sources. I don't know why, but it was always something that attracted me. Mm. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, I was, um, you, you also shared some stuff from a uh, Nike commercial you've been working on too. And uh, it's really beautiful. I'm going to bring that up as well and talk a little bit about that. Okay. Well, this is a commercial that I did with Arthur Jaffa. Um, and Arthur, AJ, Arthur Jaffa is another whole conversation because he, I think when I was in grad, I'm not sure how old I was when, when the movie came out, but I saw Doors of the Best. I remember at that time he was young, I think, when, when he did that. He might have been in his 20s or like early 30s or something, I'm not sure, but he was young. And um, I just remember, so I was young, yeah. So I just remember watching that and like being, for some reason, just thinking that that was just, I was like, if I can ever be an artist, I'd want to be him. You know, I want to work like him. 
and until this day, I think, you know, when I watch, I go back and I watch Crooklyn, which is a movie I love. I look at the way AJ thinks about light and form and, and his naturalistic approach. Um, it's a big influence on me, you know? So when he called me to, to, to shoot this with him, it was like, you know, Arthur Jaffer just asked me to shoot commercial. <laughs> it was like full circle. You know, and I have another interesting story about Brad and Malik too, in reference to that. You know, so two people that also were Bradford Young and Malik Saeed, who are also major influences on me. And, um, you know, I don't know if you want me to tell the story. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, please. How did you guys meet? Well, I met Bradford, uh, I think he would remember. I met him because this is early, early, early on when he was like, out of Howard and had like dreadlocks. And he was like, I was in the music business and I was working with um, uh, Afropunk a lot as a husband and as a promoter, you know, working with, with Matthew Morgan and, and um, James Spooner, who were sort of heading it at the time. And James had made a documentary about Afropunk, but then he made a, a narrative film sort of based on a character, an Afropunk type character. And Bradford was the young cinematographer that shot it. And I remember we all went to dinner with the producers and, and the director and, and I was sitting next to Brad and talking to him because I told, they all knew, people kind of knew that I was a photographer and I was kind of interested. And um, I told Brad then, I was like, this is years before I started shooting. I was like, hey man, you know, if I was brave, if I had any gumption, I would be doing what you're doing. And he was like, maybe, yeah, maybe one day, you know? And then I don't think I seen him again after that for years. And then, I think right around the time he had done Pariah, I think right afterwards or something, I can't tell if it was before, right? I'm not sure if it was before he won Sundance or not. I ran into him literally in my neighborhood in Bedford Stuyvesant at the time. I was living in Bedford in Brooklyn. And he was in the corner. Like he was, he was viewing like a, he was like he was looking at something. And I didn't know what it was at the time. And I walked up to him. I said, are you, are you Bradford? Because he didn't have dreads anymore. I kind of, and he was like, yeah. And I was like, oh, man. I was like, what, what's going on? He was like, I'm watching Malik Saeed. They're, he's working with Spike, shooting a, a pilot for show, uh, Showtime. And I don't think it ever got picked up. But then I was like looking at the crew. And I was like, wow, man, this is the whole crew was African-American, like 90% of it. And I was just like, wow, man, this is like crazy. I don't think I've ever seen this many Black people on the crew <laughs> before like this. And like, you know, every level, you know, every department. and. Uh, I was just like kind of blown away and I was like, you know, he was talking to me and I was like, hey man, I just started shooting a little bit. You know, I don't know if you remember our conversation. He was like, where? And I was like, you know, I would love to meet Malik. You know, he's like an, kind of an idol of mine. And I still have like a copy of Clockers, like American Cinematography issue of Clockers literally at home. Like I've had it since like, you know, it's cool, whatever. And I ran home and I got it. And I brought it and he, Brad introduced me to Malik and Malik signed it. <laughs> he, was in, he was like, you're shooting? I was like, yeah, man, so I'll get back and get into it. And he's like, all right, man, well, good luck, you know? And I was, and then this, it's just so funny because right before this whole pandemic thing happened, you know, I've known, sort of been around Malik um, since then, of course, you know, but not a whole lot. And uh, right before this pandemic happened, I just finished doing commercial with A.G. Rojas, who I love as a filmmaker, as a person, he's an amazing, I love to work. He's amazing. But um, I just finished that. And I, while I was in LA on that job, I got a call from a producer in Jamaica, on my agent. And then they hooked me up with a producer in Jamaica. And they were like, they want you to do this um, uh, Usain, Usain Bolt commercial in Kingston. And um, I talked to the producer. And the producer's like, yeah, we got your name. We heard about you through Malik Saeed. <laughs> and I was like, wow, man. I was like, damn, man, that's, that's amazing, you know? He, yeah. would, he would put me up for a job that maybe he couldn't do or something. <laughs> <laughs> so it's cool, so. Yeah, that's, that's, that's always the best stories to hear. Those are so cool. Um, yeah. I've got some interesting questions coming in from our audience, and um, there's a couple here that I see, and it was actually one that I had. Um, written down as well, and that's about collaborations, you know, and the people that you find yourself continuing to work with and really enjoying working with. 
And mm -hmm. uh, I think you've mentioned a few already. Is there any others that you haven't mentioned that uh, like to talk about? Well, I really love working with a young director named Daniel Kaufman. I've done a couple of commercial things and music videos with him. Um, talked about Angel, um, AG, um, Terrence, of course. He's like my brother, but also, you know, my major, major, major inspirations as well. Mm. And, and it's because I just worked with AB, I just worked with Amy Rockwell on a campaign. Mm. I loved working with her. She, I find her incredibly um, talented and intuitive, and, you know. And that's, really, and those collaborations for you are, are because of the inspiration, because of the energy you draw from them? Um, or yeah, I mean, I think I think in any time, I think in any collaboration between the director and the cinematographer, you know, you you find each it's like a it's like a romance, you know, in a way you find each other, you know, sometimes in a very romantic way. Either the, either the director sees your work, and they see you, in some way, you know that, you know a you know a life partner would see you, in a certain way where they see something specific about you that they say, oh, this is, and there are a million cinematographers that you can choose, right? You know, and they're, I'm sure they get an agency sent, agency sent hundreds of cinematographers, but then when the director says, I choose you, it's a date, <laughs> you know, and it's sort of romantic. You know, I find all of my collaborations with all of the directors that I've worked with, I fall in love with them in some way, mm. you know. It's like, um, because you're, you're coming from this creative place together, you know, you're both vulnerable and, you know, you have to trust one another and it's a very emotional, intense, as you know, especially in the independent film world, it's, it's intense hours. It's, you know, it's a struggle for the most part, but it's like this beautiful struggle, right? And then, so that's a recipe for love, <laughs> you know, no matter what the gender or whatever, the person is that you're working with, that's never, that's, you know, you know, it's not a romance, obviously, physically, but it's a love affair, you know? So for me, it's always like, in the time I'm working with this person, I'm dating them, you know? <laughs> and we're, we're co-creating, we're making children, <laughs> uh, <laughs> visual children, you know? Maybe that's intimidating. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't be saying that because you'd be intimidated for some <laughs> Not dating, dating, but you know, it's a, it's a romance of, of collaboration. It's a romance of uh, intention, you know? And I'm a very, like, personally, I, I'm a very, I'm not a hyper-masculine person. I mean, I'm not, you know, my way I walk through the world is m more gentle, you know, and probably more, uh, I wouldn't say feminine in terms of mannerisms, maybe a you know in terms of whatever the stereotype is, but the trope is. But I'm feminine in terms of my way of relating to people. I'm more, I'm softer, I'm more internal, so I'm much quieter. I speak to people in, in this sort of tone, and I'm quieter when I'm, you know, I'm out of my presence on set is internal. It's power. It's power through um, knowing what I want, but also being internal and peaceful and quiet and um, creating an atmosphere of, of more joy and love than antagonism and fear, you know? It's like a brave love to me. And you, when you set a tone like that, you know, with your collaborators and you're on, a, on all levels, they're more open to the love affair, you know? They're more open to being their highest, most intuitive, creative self as opposed to be more analytical or more fear-based or yeah so, although it's tough you create something that's for you know you create the soil and the, for creative for beauty to happen you know? mm -hmm. and you and you, obviously f when you find your crew when you find your camera crew you find your lighting crew the people you need to work with um how easy is it to find people that are going to fit that environment for you i mean i interview my keys you know, very, I interview my keys and I take references, you know, you know, I mean, Braff is a very good friend of mine. And so if I, if there's a key that he recommends, it's usually because he's also similar in his approach, you know, to people and how he likes to relate on set. 
So a lot of times if I'm, I'll ask someone who has a similar personality to, to mine, who they like working with, you know. I also, I tend to feel like there's, a, there is this sort of an association with, um, you know, we listen to Roger Deakins talk, you know, he's here his tonality and sort of, he's very internal, you know, his world, his, his being feels very like loving, you know, mm -hmm. or if you listen to Conrad Hall or Harris Savides or, um, you know, the guys, I, Darius Kanji, all these guys that I constantly look at their work. It's, it's, it's technical. I'm looking at it for, you know, I'm looking at seven, you know, because of, of, of the small sources that are close and all those kind of things. I'm looking for things that are technical, but also I'm looking for empathy. <laughs> I'm looking for those photographers where I find that you can tell there's a lot of love in them, a lot of empathy. And then, so there's like their, their attention to what's implicit, you know, is translated through the technology, through the techniques that they're using. You know? mm. And we can go into we can go into films and stuff like that if you want to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd love to. I I want to make sure we get some of the questions from the audience because there's some good ones coming in. There's uh, okay. someone that's really loves your work and says it, it reminds them of abstract art, and they're asking about how you prep for that and how much you accomplish in camera versus what you have to do in post. Well, in terms of prep, I mean, you know, obviously, depending on the medium, whether it's a commercial or a long form uh, project, you know, there's a lot of obviously location scouting and, and collaborating with the director to kind of find the locations that, you know, will both lend um, sort of the best opportunity for production design and, and, um, and lighting. Uh, you know, in order to kind of find the truth of, of the scene and find the truth of the character. So I'm always like, with, during prep in terms of shot listing and location scouting, and you know, you really have to know the story and the characters, you know, you really have to sort of immerse yourself in world building. And what to, what's, what's your imagination around this world? Where, is it, where does it take you intuitively? You know, and, and once that, you start referencing that, that micro information of your and that's in your super computer and then you pull out a memory and sometimes you're walking to a location and walk into and you know sort of compare images with the production designer and the director and, and you'll, you'll just know you know like this is i think this is close to where it's supposed to feel and hopefully you're um, in line with with the um the director and that choice and then you know once you kind of make the choice then you start thinking about you know, how you want to feel, then you, you think, start thinking about where the direction of the light's gonna come from, what the quality that that light is, you know, how you achieve that quality uh, technically. You know, you start talking to your collaborators, you know, your, your gaffer and your key grips around, you know, how you wanna shape it, you know, how you want to, you know, so then, you know, my philosophy though for lighting is usually as simple as humanly possible. If it can be one light, I'll do that. And it's, the rest is negative, you know. If you look at the Arthur Jaffa uh, Nike commercial, when the, there's a, a shot where the kid's in the living room with his sister on the couch, I think that's like literally two in 90s bouncing into maybe some open house or something on the ground. So they're pointed down on the ground. You know, there's a flag, like there are flags flying off the window so that sunlight never reaches inside. And so it's completely controlled. Um, and then there's a bunch of diffusion. Yeah, and there's a bunch of diffusion in that window. But that's, you know, that source is completely controlled. And then, obviously, I like to set, I like to set my color temperatures on the camera. Camera to be by around 49 a lot of times, maybe 45, so that daylight is a little cooler, and then my tungsten sources are a little bit still warm. Um, and I really, I'm attracted, like in this image particularly, I can. So in this image, in the very, I don't know if I'm answering your question, I'm sorry, but That's in, this right. particular, yeah. in this particular image, there's the source inside of this fake, this, this is a, a shell of a TV, it's actual TV, but so there's a source inside the TV as sort of keying the, the kids from the front. That, that practical source um, on the stairwell, like by the door, that was there. This 
uh, mercury vapor source that's to the left of them I added. So I added a couple of like practical mercury vapor sources to sort of color contrast with the sodium and tungsten sources that are there. There's a, in this balcony to the right above, there's a ARRI 120 with probably a, a control grid and some diffusion that's back that's backlighting them sort of as a rim. And then in way in the distance, um, in by where you see like sort of a streak of light on the ground, there I think there are two S60s with sodium, like a sodium color that is that are, that are scraping the ground there and highlighting that that building so you can have a little depth. Um, so yeah, I can have some depth. In there. This is totally dark. It's just the only source of light that would have been there naturally would have been that door light. Mm. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, and there's another one, there's another light raking. That 120 is what you're seeing raking on the ground there too, and the ground so you can see it. So that's all that, it feels very natural, you know, I think, but it's, it's designed, you know, to right. feel that way. It's designed to feel that way. It's really beautiful. There's, um, a question about an aesthetic goal that you would still like to accomplish in your, you know, is there, what's your next step that you'd like to take? Yeah, I'm, I'm against aesthetic goals. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think that we, I kind of feel like cinematography has gone in a very aesthetic conversation. I, I it was so funny because I've been saying this for a few years now and I just read an article where Roger Deakins was saying the same thing. Um, not to compare myself with Roger Deakins, but he is a Gemini like myself, and he's like, I think, I'm the 28th and he's the 27th of May, and Gordon <laughs> Will's also the 28th of May. <laughs> um, uh, I do think that, you know, we're moving into, because it's, we're in the most image, sort of, like, this is the, the, the photographic era, you know, and everything, so everything is, sharing of photographs and it's, it's so ubiquitous and there's so many mediums, so many mm. people have access to cameras. And I do feel like there's a trend to sort of, for, for a lot of us to be, um, you know, sort of competitive and trying to go down. It's like a specific aesthetic that is like of the day that people, that we all, I think, can get caught up into because a lot of the agencies or advertising agencies are you know, looking for a specific look and there's been like, a drive towards, let's say, underexposure or silhouettes, you know, whatever. And a lot of us as cinematographers will tend to um, follow a certain thing to exercise, you know, in terms of sort of find our own voice in. But I'm sort of, I think personally, I'm more interested in um, sort of unpacking all of that and sort of being really more intuitive around what the story needs. Not, but not just that, just like, being brave if something needs to be ugly, you know, or if something needs to be super high key, you know. I don't think an operating room, when someone's being operated on the scene, should be dark. <laughs> you know? It's like, I want my surgeon to have as much light on my body and my veins and my heart as soon as much as possible, you know. So I think the scene should feel what they should feel like. Um, I've been watching a lot of John Schlesinger recently, you know and just thinking about sort of how, how free that camera is and how kinetic it is in his films and how much I feel those characters and the psychology of the film, you know, it's not like this you know, sort of like composed perfect keys and perfect images, you know, that you can frame grab or whatever. It's, some of it is, but the most of it is just it just feels real. It just feels like a world. You know, the world building level is like, that doesn't say I don't love aesthetic, you know, things that are aesthetically, aesthetically beautiful and perfect. I do love that too. I think when you see somebody who's a master, like you make something that's so sublimely beautiful, I'm like, whoa, I'm blown away by that too. But um, I'm much more interested in having my body of work um, be varied mm -hmm. and not, not like you can't, I don't want someone to be, I think there's always going to be you, you, because I have a certain past and experience and my approach to seeing the world is very personal, you know, and so I'm always going to be there in, in it, but um, I don't want it to be so like, 
this right. is what Sean Porter does. You know, I want people to be like, everything I do, I want people to be like, wow, I don't want to be seen as, as clearly as that. You know, I want to. Yep. Oh, that's great. <laughs> well, thank you. I, the, the hour is gone already and I don't know why, but I really appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for joining us and all your time and commitment to this. It's been great talking with you. <laughs> okay, man. Thank you guys. I appreciate you, man. We'll talk thank soon. You. Bye. <laughs> and um, thank you to all of you who joined us today. Um, our episodes are going to be available on our website, arirental.com, where you can also check out all of our unique and exciting products that we offer. And you can follow us on youtube.com forward slash Airy Rental Group. And until next time, cheers, everyone. <laughs>